right, Diana Willett, go for it. Hi, my name is Willett and this is Diane. And together we own Burger Chan. Uh, we opened up about four years ago and um, we were originally Kuma Burgers. We had to go through a name change uh, due to a cease and desist from Kuma's Corner in Chicago. And um, we've just been down here in Greenway Plaza. It's, there's a little food court for the office building here. And it's really uh, been a very interesting journey. A lot of good restaurants have come down here. We were kind of introduced to it by the owner of Greenway Coffee and the owner of Rice Box. They extended, um, they kind of asked us if we were interested in coming down here and initially the the answer was no because I wanted to do a different concept. I wanted to do Southeast Asian food, uh, Singaporean food specifically. I went to boarding school there uh, for a couple of years and uh, fast forward a little bit, uh, the rent, the schedule, everything about being down here in the food court seemed to make sense. So I thought, how could I get my flavors um, and translate them into burgers? And this is where we are. Um, and I am a middle school math teacher by trade. I have no cooking training and I have no business cooking anybody's food. Um, and so we work really well together because he's the culinary talent and I just fill in the rest of the gaps, whether it's front of house, whether it's payroll, whether it's social media, um, which has been very, very important during this time um, is really staying update, updated on social media because since so many people are at home right now and so many things are, are changing daily, it's been really important to stay on Instagram, to stay on Facebook. Um, but to just give you a little bit of background about where we are, I mean, our location is currently right behind us and um, what has originally been a pro for us has now become a con. The pro is our, our built-in office clientele, right? So we're in an underground food court and we would get, you know, a steady line. It didn't matter if we had social media or not, right? People are hungry, they're sitting in their cubicles, come 11, 1231, they're down here, you know, lines, 10 deep, online orders going off, right? So we had it made in a way. And uh, then when everyone had to work from home, our built-in clientele disappeared. And um, doors are locked, right? Everyone's working from home. And so we took two weeks off because we were like, what are we gonna do? We, you know, we're underground, no one can see us above ground. Um, even if you're driving by, you would completely miss us. And so we really did have to pivot. And I know we'll talk more about that later. Um, but really, you know, when I'm listening to Marinda, and I'm like, man, she sounds really smart. She's thought a lot about this. And, and in contrast, we got hit really hard across the face. And it's just like, how do we keep this alive with nobody here? We really have to, to reach across Houston to get people to pick up curbside. I'm like, I'll deliver to you. I just want to make the food. I, I just want to give you food. Like, please order so that we can get through this. Yeah, absolutely. Go ahead, Miranda. Um, we were where you were when Harvey hit. Um, literally, we went from having $50,000 in catering on the books to everyone calling, canceling, initially because of the flooding. But then for the next six to eight weeks, people said, I'd feel really bad having a big party and so many people are still suffering and they've lost their home. And that was a real wake up call. I don't know if you still teach because we're kind of the same dynamics. My husband is a certified culinary instructor. He comes from a family of caterers. He's constantly doing additional education and keeping his certifications current. Our household, everything, our kids' ability to go to the schools that they go to, my daughter's now at Rice University, all of that depends on our catering business. There is no other revenue. So we love what we do. Uh, we toyed with the idea of one of us going back to work 
Um, my husband is a teacher, which is funny. Our stories are very similar. He was a high school culinary teacher. And we thought, is that the route to go? And a funny thing happened when this pandemic started and we started, you know, still freaking out because still the bulk of our revenue comes from catering. Bering started calling every day for a new order. And what we learned is even during the pandemic, people still need food. And if they can go by and pick it up in the grocery store at Barry's Hardware, we now even offer our products from our location in the Heights, which we've never done before. We have a product that we can now get into people's hands no matter what's going on, which is why we're opening up the shipping line. It takes time. The one blessing for us is I took my rice economics degree and business degree very seriously. We've always, we made the mistake early on of getting a lease that was what we thought was reasonable. And it went from being $6,800 in August by December with additional cams and tax increase. It was over 10 grand. Our overhead all of a sudden bloomed into $35,000 a month before we made a penny. And after we left that space, we agreed that there were some things that we could control. One, we own the building that's our commissary. And because we own it, our rent is less than what I pay for my house note. Um, the fact that both of us work in the business, uh, like yourself, I do everything from food production, where food production ends, booking clients, doing the marketing, doing payroll, doing all those things we can control some of our costs. So we were in a position even before PPP loans and all of those other things to say, okay, we can cover ourselves for the next six to eight months. How can we turn this business into something that no matter what's going on in the country, we can be successful. And that's when you have to start reaching out to your customers. We do family meals now. And we've increased our production for our retail products. And that's something that we understand now we can never stop. Even if catering comes back, we've got to continue to build products that I can get to people no matter what's going on. Thank you for, for sharing that. I think it's time to open it up for other questions as well, if, if anybody has them. And uh, feel free to you know, to raise your hand or put it in the, in the chat and yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll start with Rob. How about that? Hi. So, uh, um, uh, just at, by way of background, uh, I'm an investor, a very small one in the restaurant in DC, which seems to be barely surviving, but I, and my son is a chef in Australia, a CIA grad, uh, and, uh, they made a major pivot from sit down, uh, high end sit down Latin American to, uh, carry out. And they were helped by um, the fact that they are a, they also serve a lot of liquor. Their name is Tequila Mockingbird. And, and uh, Padron gave them uh, 4,000 bottles, single and double serve, and discounts on their liquor. And uh, I'm guessing neither one of you does alcohol. Uh, I do. So the care, oh, do you? Okay. I do. So, so the carry out, that part is really beneficial to you, I am sure. And you guys, well, you guys don't, right, or do? Yeah. So what, uh, I'm curious, um, you know, Miranda, you made a pivot, uh, a strategic pivot, um, and uh, some time ago, will it, you guys, have you, what have you done? Have you been able to pivot? What's your solution to this? So our pivot is, right, if, if our office, built-in office clientele dries up, who are we serving? Right. And so, so we, we pivoted to everyone else who's above ground. Um, and so a lot of people, thankfully, they, they follow us on social media and they say, oh, we've always wanted to try your food, but Monday through Friday, breakfast and lunch, I just can't get down there. And I'm like, hey, you don't have an excuse anymore. You're stuck at home. You can drive. I can bring it to you. Um, and so the pivot that we did is we took, we took our employees and we set up this curbside um, pickup and, and our friend made this great video because it's really hard to find us unless you watch the video and, and Google Maps takes you here. And uh, we took some of our employees and made them in-house delivery drivers. So it's contactless within an eight mile radius. And, 
And what's great about that is um, companies like Uber Eats and whatnot, right, they take 30% versus when I'm using in-house delivery, right, all the delivery fees, all the tips, those are going to my staff. And not only that, you know, it's going to be timely. They can contact the driver. They understand what contactless means. So it's, it's peace of mind for the customer and for us to know that the food is being delivered um, with integrity. Yeah. And, and um, are you receiving any help, let's say, from the local social media, like has the had the newspapers written about local carryout and I like Brenda, the same question to you guys, um, that would certainly help. Yeah, so um, a few of the food writers have posted um, or they created these databases, right? So if you really wanna support local restaurants, they have these lists of all the restaurants and what options. I think, I think it's a little bit, it was more pertinent near the end of March. And now that a lot of restaurants are opening up and you know their dining rooms are opening up, it's becoming um, a little bit less um, needed because the majority of restaurants are now open. And I think what people don't realize is that just because we're open doesn't mean um, we're not struggling, right? So people read in the news and they hear like, oh man, you know, um, offices can go back now. You guys are like back to normal, right? And I'm like, no, the doors are still locked. These offices are coming back July, August. People are getting laid off because there are a lot of oil and gas industries here, right? And gas, gas prices were plummeting. Like there are some days where we get 10 to 20 people when normally we get 200, right? So so this is not back to normal, but you know we can't complain in that we're trying our best to get as many orders as we can, and every order, whether it's one burger or ten, like is amazing to us. We, so my let. Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. We're also lucky to tap into um, organizations that provide meals for medical staff. So um, every here and there, you know, they will say we need a hundred meals for this hospital, or fifty meals here, fifty meals there. Uh, and instantly we're doubling or tripling our sales for that day. Uh, personally, I've also started accepting private cooking gigs, uh, which I've been turning down for a while. Just, it wasn't exactly my passion. I did it for a year and we transitioned. Um, I went back into restaurants, uh, but now it's a good way just to get a little personal extra savings. Mm -hmm. And, uh, the last question uh, is, uh, it sounds like, again, like Miranda, you figured out your, how your pivot's working. I'm just curious whether you guys are uh, considering a, a different path, a new business model once this is over. Definitely. Catering cannot make up the bulk of our revenue. Um, again, we're fortunate with the contract. One of the things I would recommend uh, for you guys is to consider becoming certified in whatever area, applying for um, your SAMS number. It's a government number. There are lots of contracts out there with the government. Uh, our particular contract, everyone who joins the armed services goes through one building and they get fed one meal while they're there. And we provide that meal for the Coast Guard, Marines, Army. There are lots of contracts out there like that. Those are our base. That is what allows us to pay the bills, keep the employees, while we continue to build on our retail products. When catering comes back, we'll be very thoughtful of what catering we do. And there are some contracts that we have that are in facilities that we are really talking right now, does that make sense for us moving forward? So we will definitely be a different company when this is over. We have a question uh, from Melinda McLean. She says, here in the Bay Area, Yelp and other tech platforms have made a big difference in getting the word out about changes in offerings. Uh, and what platforms have you guys uh, found to be the most helpful? For me, it was Facebook. And remember, we're not a restaurant. So I think there's two reviews, uh, one of a person we never met or never saw that <laughs> is out there on Yelp for us uh, because we don't have the normal foot track, but I normally have one person booking food for 500 people. 
So I don't have the reviews that would make Yelp a worthwhile platform for us. What we found that on Facebook and Instagram, we get the best response. So we post on Facebook and Instagram once to twice per week. Um, we do the boost on Facebook, which tends to help. We've doubled the number of followers during the pandemic just because we're more active and we've done more of the boost. Uh, but definitely Facebook for us has been the best platform. So um, Yelp, we're on Yelp. And um, I think just recently, I think it expired in May 31st, Yelp kind of opened up all of their premium features to allow local restaurants to kind of capitalize on um, all these ways that we could get business. And so I took advantage of it, but once May 31st, I was like, hey, I don't really want to pay for this in that at the end of the day, Yelp is like marketing advertising. It's like, I'm already bleeding money. So if there are free ways to, to market, that's what I'm going to do. So predominantly I've been using Instagram and Instagram links to Facebook and Instagram links to Twitter. So I've been using that. Um, uh, what's been really helpful is, is posting on stories right? Because we do online ordering only. It was a tough decision to make, right? Because some people want to come up and order, but we're like, look, you know, given coronavirus to protect you, to protect our staff, we understand it's a little bit inconvenient, but we're only doing online ordering. And so um, Instagram offers a way for me to post a story. And on the story, I can add a little button that says order online now. And so I'm just eliminating all the excuses uses for why people are not ordering. I'm like, I'm going to bring it to you. I have this button on stories. Um, and I think people, you know, now that they're at home more often and on their phones more often, it's really helpful to, to keep everyone updated, not only on, you know, what specials we have or what we're offering, but just what our life is like, right? So like some days we have really bad days, our power went out. We're posting about that, you know, just showing everyone that, you know, at the end of the day, we're people too, we're going through this as people, as business owners, um, and just really having kind of that transparency to say, you know, we're struggling, we know you're struggling, we're gonna show you the struggle, um, but we're also gonna show you the highs as well, and we just hope that, you know, we can all have a little fun through all of this on social media and, and get through it. Um, I saw a couple of questions pop up, so I'm just gonna answer them real quick. Uh, we do have t-shirts for sale. Um, if you just go to our website um, or you can email us, we have merchandise that's available on, on our online ordering. Uh, it's kind of limited what you can get. Sometimes we'll have extra old shirts, like the gray shirt I'm wearing is not for sale, but if you email us uh, with your size, we might have it in inventory and we might uh, be able to, to sell it. Here's uh, our... Uh... Here's our latest shirt. This is our latest Instagram post. I was having a little fun. So we just put our faces on the models. And, you know, we, historically, we haven't had fun colors like pink and green. But it's like, hey, um, if you're stuck at home and you get, you, get, you know, the, the term is spendemic, right? If you're going to use your stimulus money, maybe help us out, even though you can't support us by buying a burger. It'd be really helpful if people can, you know, people, they want to help. So, so we're putting that merchandise out there. Um, Say, hey, you know, every little bit counts. And I saw a question about uh, online ordering. So we have two platforms. We have Chow Now, uh, which is great. We've been using that from the beginning. Uh, they don't take a percentage. They take a flat fee. They help build out an app for your store. So if you go to whether the Apple Store or Google Store um, and you search Burger Chan, you'll see our app. Uh, and we also do ritual just because ritual uh, tends to be in areas where offices are clustered and it's an easy way for office workers to see what's nearby. Um, I saw the question about how we got started. Um, I was just kind of a funny story. Um, when I left Rice, I did consulting, mostly financial business consulting, predominantly for a lot of guys who had left the oil industry and were doing small businesses on their own. But I did then, and amazingly, 20 years later, I'm 
chairing again the organization at the museum. It's called the African American Art Advisory Association. And we help purchase art for the museum's permanent collection as well as bring attention to uh, African art and artists and African American art and artists. So I booked this event with the catering company that was owned by, at the time, Reginald Martin. And um, he, we talked briefly and I wind up marrying, I mean, ignoring this guy for six months because I thought he was already married. And then we got that straightened out. We dated for six weeks. We were married, we were engaged six weeks later and we were married six weeks after that. So I always tell people I accidentally married into the catering business. Uh, if you had asked me while I was at Rice, would I ever get in this industry? I would have told you absolutely not. I'm gonna be in accounting or finance. And as a husband and wife team, we've learned to complement each other. Uh, we've learned each other's strengths as well as each other's weaknesses. Uh, like uh, her, I do not cook at all. I mean, I'm really good. I, I do, I make a few desserts, but that's it. Other than that, my husband literally says I'm not allowed in the kitchen. Um, but I'm great with selling his wares. There was an article about uh, our company by Allison Cook. And that's what she says, you know, she, that I'm great at selling my husband's products. And that's what I do. I take, we make sure we offer the very best product or services that we can. And then we offer them in a way that people will enjoy them. People will appreciate them and people will hopefully remember their experience. So. I would say if you wanted to get into this industry right now, I'd tell you maybe take a pause on that. Uh, but I also think there'll be some opportunities out there uh, when this is over. Decide what it is you want to do, what it is you want to achieve, and then work your way backwards. I am always happy to talk with someone one-on-one -on -one about this industry, give them pointers, point them into the direction of great resources of how to get started but you have to determine what it is you want from this industry. Is it about money? Is it about, I just want to, my, for my husband, it's a passion. He loves to cook. He loves to create things and he loves to see people enjoy them. It's not at all about money, but at the end of the day, it's a business owner. We have to have the ability to pay our bills. So we found a nice merger between those two where we keep our overhead low so we're not forced to do just any and everything and we have the opportunity to do projects that we like we still have the opportunity to do um, charitable things in the community uh, after Katrina we literally from our restaurant served people who were from New Orleans who had run out of money living in hotels we served meals for six weeks uh, after Harvey, we literally went to some of the hardest hit communities and just said, for a few hours, let us take care of you. And we did, you know, large meals and we got volunteers to help. So we found a way to, one, help him live out his passion of loving food, to make money at what we do, but also found a way to give back to the community through what we do. Diane and Willett, do you guys have any advice for, for new graduates, perhaps? Um, whatever you choose to do, be flexible. You never know when you have to do something else, when you have to pivot, or when you need to go to plans B, C, D, whatever. Just, Z. Yeah. Um, and my background too, so I graduated um, with degrees in sociology and Asian studies and um, I was going to become a sociology professor. So I, I lasted one quarter at the University of Washington at the sociology PhD program. Um, and you know, I was always really good at school, so I didn't really know what I wanted to do once I graduated. So I thought, hey, more school, then I'll have more time to figure it out. Um, but once I got there, I think I just, I felt like this wasn't really what I wanted to do. I've always really liked teaching. I've always really enjoyed learning, um, taking sociology courses, but I think teaching and researching sociology is a completely different thing. And, and that's one of those things where you just realize if I do it, right? 
I thought I had a great plan. Um, we moved to Seattle and, you know, quickly things just didn't feel right. And I think that being able to, as my husband said, be flexible, but also kind of just trust your gut, right? If you feel like something isn't working, like try other things. I think, I think the beauty of a rice degree is it, you know, we don't have majors that are super, super specific, right? And you take courses all over the place with your dissertation. <coughs> and I think it really just prepared us to, it prepared us for the unknown, right? Like mm -hmm. nobody saw this coming. Um, and, you know, later on this year, we were supposed to open our second location, our first location above ground, brick and mortars, you know, serving more interesting stuff, serving stuff, uh, evenings and on Saturdays and we're finally serving beer and wine and it seemed like up and up right and now we're just we're we have tunnel vision we're trying to get through this when people ask us about the second location we're like that's that's we'll think about that next year right uh, we're just trying to be creative and, and get through this one thing I would add if you are seriously thinking about going into this industry or in any industry is to have an exit plan. That's part of that unknown or whatever. So everything we do and anything we do, we say we have X number of dollars set aside. We have given ourselves six months or a year to do this. And the one thing I, I tell people all the time, don't be afraid of failure. Just think of it as I figured out that this doesn't work and give yourself you know, give yourself room to make mistakes, but you do have to have a plan. Like whenever we start a new business, we literally say a new line of business. We literally say, here's X number of dollars for this project, which will cover our expenses for eight months, six months, a year or whatever that is. And these are the goals that we need to reach in order for us to say that this venture is successful, but it really is okay to need to pivot or need to do something different or not open up this year and do it the next year, that's part of being in business. Nothing is going to, no matter how much planning we do and put things on paper and say in eight months we're gonna do this and 10 months we're gonna do this, Harvey happened. That put plans off for six months to a year. You know, um, I, I joke November is literally the busiest time of year for us, the absolute bus busiest. We do you know, six figures in November. I've had two babies in November. I've had surgery in November. I mean, you never know what's going to happen. You just have to have plans in place and other people who can assist you through those difficult times. So we have uh, Christina asked um, at Willet, you mentioned private cooking gigs. Um, could you just expand on that a little bit more and how you came across that opportunity? Sure. So at one point, um, I devoted myself to personal and private chefing. Um, I had a website and I got very lucky at the agent of an M NBA player, uh, Tracy McGrady, T-Mac. Uh, contacted me and I was his private chef for half a year and that was several years ago um, right now it's mainly just every now and then someone will contact me uh, someone might be offered uh, an opportunity to cook at someone's house and most of my friends are really busy as well they own restaurants they, they'll just say no and of course whoever was asking them will say well do you know anyone and so they'll ask around, they'll just email or text like 50 people and, you know, usually the answer is no. And I think most people are, are still saying no. Um, but right now, usually the answer is yes. So uh, it's just good timing. And I've gone and done three of them in the past month. I have another one coming up this Saturday. Um, it's interesting. You always kind of walk into the unknown. You're going to someone's house. You don't know if they have everything that you need. You don't know what the dynamics going to be. Um, definitely something where you have to be very, very flexible. And uh, the money is pretty good usually. So it's very helpful right now. And uh, again, I'm just lucky that with our hours, I have the time and ability to go and do it versus 
there have been some that I've tried to pass on to others and they're just like, no, I have a restaurant to run. I can't, I can't actually leave this place at that time. And I would add just, um, in, in a way it's been a, a silver lining in, um, as a result of this is in that, um, people think of, of my husband as a burger chef. And what people don't know is that, A, he never thought he'd be cooking burgers, and B, burgers aren't even his passion. The only reason that, that we're a burger restaurant is that the, the restaurant space down here was a burger restaurant and they needed us to replace the burger restaurant. So he thought, well, how hard could burgers be? And I think that people often overlook the fact that, you know, he went to culinary school. He was on the, you know, the opening team for Oxart, which is one of the, you know, top restaurants back then in Houston. And so these, these opportunities have been really great for him to flex that culinary muscle and, and create an omakase meal and to create a special, you know, uh, birthday meal, a baller board with steak and lobster to celebrate your 40th birthday. And, um, you know, because he's like, man, I'm so tired of making burgers every day and people thinking that's all I can do. So um, he's, you know, he's been really happy in a way being able to make these menus and, and kind of do food outside, outside of burgers. Very cool. Rob did say that he is having an issue with getting the site to send his shirt to Virginia. So, <laughs> so, so if you order the shirt, um, you just have to select the USPS shipping option. You can, yeah. you can I, the pick up and then. And then I, I, I did that actually, but it wouldn't, it didn't translate across the screens once I signed in to create an account. So I, I'll, I'll try one more time and I have your email here if it doesn't work. Yeah, we'll, we'll work with you to figure it and, out. We'll, we'll get a shirt to you. And, and Miranda, those sausages sounded great, but I bet you don't mail those to Virginia either. You know what? Probably not during the summer, but in the fall. The silver lining for us is Reginald has been making lots of different types of sausages. Uh, we actually yeah. going to post some video later today of him hand making yeah. sausages. Um, Hot weather probably won't do that well. Also, there are delays right now because of everything going yeah. on. Once there's back, we're back to the regular schedule and the temperature goes down, we'll be able to ship some of the frozen items. Yeah. Um, but they're, they're pretty incredible. I, I actually find myself fascinated with the process of watching him make sausage by hand and then smoke them. Uh, I grew, my parents were born in the 1920s and this is things that they did all the time and this is how they fed themselves so it's kind of fun to watch that my husband is doing some of the same techniques that my parents and his grandparents did <laughs> you know a hundred right. years ago it's pretty cool to watch it's great and actually rob we have a question for you um yeah. how did your son get started in the business in australia did he take classes and get certified there who, who asked that uh christina <laughs> did <laughs> uh, he, my, uh, my son wanted to be a marine biologist and he decided to go to uh, the University of Miami and managed to drop out twice, burned a lot of money, uh, came home to Washington where we were then living uh, and uh, went to work with a friend of ours uh, who's one of the best known chefs in DC, a woman named Riss Lacoste who had worked with Julia Child, etc. And she literally trained him in the kitchen. Um, from fluffing salads to um, being the fish line chef. And after two years, she wrote a recommendation to the CIA in New York. And he went there, had a great uh, experience. Uh, and uh, I'm telling more than I probably should tell, but um, he came home and sat on the couch for two months. And I interviewed him one day and said, what kind of restaurant would you like to work in? And he, uh, I threw a bunch of ideas. I came up with a list of 50 or so uh, uh, in places I knew he would like the best on the planet kind of stuff, you know. And uh, he, he said, gee, these restaurants in Australia sound pretty interesting. And I was tired of him sitting on the couch. So the next day I came home with a one-way ticket. <laughs> and he said, how am I going to get home? And I said, you're going to get a job. <laughs> 
and he did, and he's been there five years. He's had some very interesting uh, experiences. It's uh, a great learning experience. He's had all the ups and downs that Miranda and, and you know Willett and Diana had, and you know we're just we're very proud of his and their pivot. You know they've just done a fabulous job, and I should say I'm a pretty good cook too. But watching him chop when he comes home is always an amazing feat. <laughs> That's more than you wanted to know, I'm sure. Okay, uh, and Christina has another question for you, Willett. Um, she asked, where did you go to culinary school? And of course, what certifications do you have? Um, I went to Lake Cordon Bleu in Austin, Texas. Um, it was a really good experience. I just got the, what is it, the Associate of Applied Sciences degree, which is, um, I guess one of the most popular options there. And uh, I actually cooked for at a sushi restaurant for a year before that. I think the culinary school is something that is not necessary per se. Um, a lot of people just come up in the ranks and learn on the job. And but it's something where if you can afford it and if you want to have a, a wide knowledge of technique, it's a good option. He, he cared more about his grades at culinary school than he did at Rice. He was so excited <laughs> to, to like study for his classes. <laughs> and My son did too. <laughs> you know, but the one thing you do learn at culinary school besides cooking is also how to balance ingredients and menus and costs and uh, rule of thumb and all that. And I know Miranda, your husband probably did that too. And you know, you just, it's a great experience if you want to be a professional chef. He definitely enjoyed it. He became a, a um, certified executive chef, uh, I'm guessing about 10 or 11 years ago. So he finished all of culinary school uh, of course, we had the business before and after, and then he decided, uh, particularly for him, because there are very few uh, African-American chefs who have the titles. Most of them have come through the ranks. And unfortunately, in some circles, you don't get the credit without the credentials. So he decided to get his um, certification. And we now actually have a, a, a licensed apprenticeship program where we can bring in people uh, that have to spend, they have to study under a certified executive chef in order for them. And it's a different route than school. It's a lot cheaper than school. Uh, depending on where you go to school, school could be anywhere from 15,000 to 100,000. And if you go the apprenticeship route, it works out to be about $3,000. So we're really excited about that to give other young people who might be interested or even and sometimes there are people who are actually up in age who are just changing careers the opportunity to work under a certified executive chef and get their credentials that way so carrie and paige i i think you should um sponsor some kind of conference at rice of uh the food industry folks you know like these folks here and um, you know there's also there are a lot of rice people in uh, in some of the new food technologies and um, there's a big wine and beer industry um, I, I spent a lot of time with some of those folks back uh, in February uh, with an NSF project and, okay uh, it'd be really interesting and you'd probably get some good attendance there's, there are quite a few rice alumni in the field. You are absolutely right. Wine and beer in particular and restaurants all across the, the nation and apparently even wider spread than that. So that's, I think that's a great idea. I'm, I was really excited for this conversation today, to be honest, and just to hear all of the, the pivoting that's happening and the resilience that is very clear. So I think that's a great idea. We can talk more about that. Um, and I have two new restaurants to go to or two new well, places for food <laughs> when I come back to Houston for board meetings. <laughs> exactly. Now everybody is expanding their repertoire, right? Yeah, Nancy. Um, I, oops, let's see. I, I wanted to ask what um, 
Marinda's uh, most popular retail product is? It's an easy answer. Louisiana bread pudding with bourbon sauce. Yeah. Uh, between <laughs> Thanksgiving and Christmas, we literally cannot make enough of it to keep, I mean, we're bringing it. One of my funny stories is when we first started this, uh, I'll take a quick minute to tell you, retail was a farthest thing from our mind. We do a party at Barry's Hardware for the Rye School for 700 people. And we make like 20 full-size pans of bread pudding. And one night, the party really had ended about 30 minutes ago, but there was literally a line of people fighting, trying to get the last bit of bread pudding out of this pan. And so the lady turned to me and she said, this is stupid. I come to this party every year just to get this bread pudding. You should sell it. And I made a flippant remark of, oh, you should get berries to sell it. And a few minutes later, the owner of the store came by and said, can you get it here on Saturday? And I said, get what here? He said, the bread pudding. <laughs> so literally, we started selling bread pudding out of a cooler just on Saturdays at Bearings, and that went on for three to four years. That just at Christmas time, we come in, and finally the store called and said, "This is ridiculous. We're answering ten calls a day about the bread pudding. Will you put in a refrigerator?" So that's one of those stories of this wasn't even a a part of the industry that we were interested in. Our customers kind of demanded it and it's gone from being something we did for fun to something that's now becoming a substantial part of our revenue stream um the bread pudding did really well especially at the holiday time and then people started asking well what else can you do and the crawfish etouffee came around and then they said what else you can do and about a year and a half ago i took the goldman sachs 10,000 business course and I said, finally, I'm going to focus on our retail products. And I redid the packaging and I got labels and did all the stuff that would allow us to go into any store. And sure enough, once we did that, our sales doubled. And we just keep working every single day on adding more products. We now have a smoked bacon, uh, fresh smoked bacon that we cure ourselves that'll be in the store shortly so now it's kind of taken a life of its own but it's definitely the bread pudding started everything and we sell more bread pudding than anything thank you so much i'm gonna by the way i'm going to variants right after this <laughs> uh, we appreciate it thank you so much we have one Maybe time for one more question. Melinda's got one in here. Um, says our community cafe plan includes hiring 50% workforce development, formerly incarcerated or hard to employ folks. Any wisdom about how to be good employers? I think that's a wonderful way to end this conversation. Will it or Diane or? <laughs> well, I don't know if we're good to answer that because I think the answer for us is we're too nice. Um, uh, we, we, you know, we have a handbook, but I think that, um, we're on the line every day. And, and so we're working amongst our employees. It's, it's, it's not really a top down approach. Like obviously we're the owners and they know that. Um, but we also work alongside them. And I think, um, part of it is, is, is the teacher in me where rules are very hard and fast but situations are, are almost always gray. So you always have to read the situation really well to figure out, are they going to respond to you know, yelling at them or are they going to respond to taking them aside and really asking what's going on? Um, and so I think that having that teacher background and having those soft skills to say, hey, um, you guys are in my employees, but you're people and treating them like people, but also having rules. A lot of the times we're like, okay, I feel like you're taking advantage of me. This is becoming a rule and I'm writing it in the handbook. Um, so I think that in general, we're just, we're pretty flexible. We try not to have too many rules and too many checklists unless it's just something that people keep forgetting. For me, um, I think whether I retain staff or not, it just depends on their motivations and attitude I have. You know, there's no hard and fast three strikes rule. You know, we have one cook who has been late hundreds of times already. Like he would have been out three years ago if, uh, if I were one of those chefs that just didn't allow people to be late. And uh, 
I have other people who come in and they just have a bad attitude and they don't work hard and they have really bad answers when something's not right and I let them go almost immediately. So the motivation matters more than the skill. For me, um, with enough training, everyone becomes adequate at their jobs. Uh, but if you don't want to be there, and that's the, I tell all my staff, like anytime there's a really bad day, I just tell everyone like, you don't want to be here, don't be here, go. I'm not begging anyone to stay. You want to be here, then you work and you get paid. Um, I will shut this place down today if you guys don't want to work. That's, you know, and I'll just go do something else. And, you know, no one's walked out yet, so no one's called my bluff yet. Or maybe I'm not bluffing. I don't know. <laughs> and, and that's the same for us. I need, it's about passion for us. You've got to be passionate about this. You've got to want to do this. This is not an easy industry. Um, there are long hours, there are, you know, so many things that can go wrong that you have to adjust for. So for me, I need people who want to be here. And we do try and work with people to give them second chances. Um, there are some areas where I don't have uh, the ability to do that. Some of our contracts require backgrounds and, and security clearance and things of that nature. But in positions where I can use people, we do. And it's always, uh, we recently hired a number two sous chef and we had one person who was just definitely more qualified on paper than the person we hired. But all I heard was, I get bored doing this. I get bored doing that. And I need someone who's passionate about making a grilled cheese sandwich for someone or passionate about serving the vice president of the United States. You've got to have that same passion no matter what you're doing. Uh, and that's really important for us. And we definitely, my husband calls them projects. When I give someone, you know, uh, an additional time to get things right or whatever, if they're passionate and they show interest in what they're doing, I'm willing to work with anyone and train you and show you all the things that we've learned in the 20 years doing this. But you've got to want to be there. Uh, that for me is the most important thing. If this is something you're just doing to get a paycheck, I tell people, it's too easy to go somewhere else and make the same amount of money without all the hassle. Uh, this is the industry to just drop in to make money at. Did you, Melinda, did you have a question? We can do, bring that one as our quick final last one. Are you good? Okay. Um, well, we were coming right up at the hour and just wanted to share our Sincere thank you to our three panelists who took some time out of, as we've heard, very, very busy time and uh, as well as our attendees as well for sharing your thoughts and questions and um, we'll hope you'll join us next time if you find the topics of interest and we'll follow up as well to share a lot of resources that were talked about today, um, how to support each other and different um, links and, and such. So keep an eye out for that. Um, and if nothing else and we hope to see you at a, another event soon and have oh, a we good... can his youtube video i mean his new youtube you channel go. yes <laughs> so, we'll that in there too it's <laughs> one of our pivots is uh is, is he's posting on youtube these um cooking related videos like how to break down fish how to break down chicken awesome. uh, what how to sharpen your knives and what knives are important so that's been a fun thing that. that we've been doing <laughs> Awesome. Yeah, we'll include that in the email too. No problem. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much, Marinda and Diana, especially. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.